it is a tricky one, certainly. And having stockists helps, I think, in terms of you know who they are and that they order every week, every second week, once a month, and you kind of get a feel of how much you're baking. So that gives you a baseline of, yes, I'm, you know, kind of know what I'm getting from these stockists, but they can order more one week and less the next week. And then it's school holidays. And so it still fluctuates, but um, you're selling to them at a wholesale price which means you're making a little bit less on your um, profit margin. So the ideal is to supplement it with um, a market or uh, retail sales yourself, private sales, so that you're making that higher margin on, on those sales to sort of balance it out a bit. Um, I know the girls who do markets, um, it's also, you know, up and down. It's not always the same at every market but it's certainly a, a good way to increase your, your income. Um, I, I suppose I'm lucky in that it's, it's not our only source of income, so it is an extra. Um, I wouldn't say I could retire on it, <laughs> but um, it's certainly been a good way to supplement what we've got coming in and to pay for some of those extras. It will fluctuate, but I think once you um, start forming relationships with a couple of good stockers, and really, uh, when I first started, I thought I would need five or seven or ten stockers, uh, but I've got two, and they keep me plenty busy uh, to do two and a half um, to three days a week if you take in, into consideration the admin that goes along with um, with running a business yourself and the deliveries, etc. But um, yeah, I. I think you, you start to build a good relationship with your, um, whole, your suppliers and it just becomes a repetitive business. So I've got a supplier um, who's incredible. Uh, it's an online organic farmer's market that um, they don't just buy, purchase or order the products from me. Um, they market the hell out of my product and out of me and they'll showcase stuff about me or um, about the products and they'll, you know, like, I think my first order with them in the first week was a hundred different products. So I think building that relationship with people and with, with, um, with other groups, uh, pr especially in um, businesses where it's about developing women and women working together, um, that will translate into um, the, the income that you're looking to get. Um, so just from the stockist on one day work a week, I basically earn more than what I ever did working in the corporate environment in one day. So if you took a day by day comparison, um, yeah, so it's, you know, it, 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 would, it would fluctuate from one to the next and depending on, on whether you decide to do markets, retail, wholesale. Yeah, and I think that, you know, um, you know, the people in your situation that they, they're, they're the sole source of the income for the house, and um, you know, it, it, and it's even just general business advice for starting out in business to not really just cut off your. I, I would never recommend cutting off your full time job to start a fledgling business. You know, um, in, and what some of the other prime ministers in that situation have done is that they've reduced their hours in their full time work, so they're still getting that stability of the income, and the the, the current job is then becoming like a, an investor in the new business, and then you know, you sort of, you've got this like transition phase where you're working the two businesses and then it's always good to kind of set a goal to say, right, well, when I hit X amount of orders or X amount of days baking or X amount of dollars, then I can release some of this other work on this side. I set my bake days quite specifically that I know that on those days and my children know that on those days, um, breakfasts are prepared before the day, lunches are prepared the night before um, and I've normally organized a dinner for those days so that if I'm baking a huge day that all those kind of things are taken care of. I'm not trying to think of family meals around that at the same time um, and I'm keeping my kitchen clean um, because my family are not all gluten-free so that means nobody's going to slice, come in and want to slice some normal bread while I'm baking. Um, so they, they now know, but they are old enough to know that, I suppose, and to understand that. But I think it's just setting some clear boundaries in, you know, I do my prep on a Monday evening, I 
bake on a Tuesday and I deliver on a Wednesday for the majority of my stockers and then you know Thursday I, I'm baking again. Um, it, yeah, I think it's just about making sure you know what those times are and when you do have the time and sticking to it. Yeah, I think, well, my kids are quite a bit younger and they've just started school this year. Um, so I think, I don't, I'm not sure if you were in the call earlier when I introduced myself, but I've got six and a half year old twin boys. Um, and one of which um, struggles a bit with sensory integration issues. So um, there's quite a lot of hands-on work that happens with him, um, you know, in terms of occupational therapy, et cetera. So it, it's just an added um, challenge to, to focus on during the week. Um, but yeah, same as Tanya, you know, setting those clear boundaries. I bake on a, I do a couple of small retail things on a Tuesday, um, only because I want to, some of them might require um, sending via Australia Post or Sendle, which you need to do earlier in the week. Wednesday is my big bake day. Thursday, I'll do some admin stuff. Like this morning, I had to do a big one because I'm doing a tasting uh, tomorrow at Stockist. Um, and yeah, I think the boundaries and making sure that everything's planned and prepped in terms of meals for those days um, does help quite a bit. And, you know, in all honesty, it's, I can still walk my kids to school, pick them up afterwards. They don't have to go to after school care. Um, so for me, the most important thing when I joined was that whatever I did um, generate an income would not be at the expense of my kids and my family. So maintaining that balance is important. And also maintaining that balance to catch up with someone for a coffee during the week. You know, so that's, that self, um, that investment in self is also something that, um, that helps to balance out what you do. I, I reckon Jai, there's quite a few of us in Perth that we're quite close, clustered together. So that was certainly a concern of mine. Um, but we just haven't hit that issue. There's just, the brand has grown, the awareness of the brand has grown, um, the demand has kept, has kept growing, uh, and you'll all find your own relationship with people, I think. Um, somebody might have approached a stockist who says no, and it's not right for them at the time, and maybe that wasn't the right relationship, and you can come along six months later and, and build a relationship. Um, I was very much wanting to stay in my local community. Uh, I didn't want to have stockers that were 45 minutes drive away. Um, and so far I've managed to do that. And when I did get a stockist a bit further away, it was a great relationship and I was happy to do it. And we negotiated um, a fee for a delivery in, or a minimum order so that it was worth my while to drive um, to that stockist but I absolutely love her shop and she loves the product and we've got a great relationship. So I think it, it is still a relationship business and yeah, it, the orders haven't stopped coming just because there's been more of us. Um, I think we've all promoted the brand in Western Australia and it's kept growing. Yeah, and I think also um, in terms of classifying stockers, when you think of the different kinds of groups of people who um, or organizations or businesses who could potentially sell the products, you're looking at health food stores, cafes. I mean, how many cafes are out there and how many of them don't have a good gluten-free or grain-free option? Um, so that's a huge market. Um, you've got the markets, if, if that's an option for you. Um, and then also, like last week, I followed up on an inquiry from um, a naturopath who's setting, setting up his own health clinic, and he often uh, recommends products to his customers. So he's wanting to put in orders, if, you know, on a weekly basis. Uh, so the market, um, I think the, the demand out there far exceeds the supply of prime ministers. And um, Kate will know from when I, uh, before I joined, one of the, my main things was whether there would be a competitor close by. And it's really funny because as soon as I joined, it, it moved from seeing other prime ministers as a competitor to um, a sisterhood. The amount of support is phenomenal. So I don't see myself as competing against anyone in Brisbane who's a prime minister. We all work together, really. I'll say the same. And I've been able to go on holiday or go and see family, take a break. And the other ladies have filled in and done my orders and... Um, so my business doesn't stop because I've taken some time off or had to go um, away for an emergency or whatever. It, it keeps going because 
there's a great relationship between all of us around here and we support each other through one of the girls ovens broke so she could phone me and say can you bake for me this week because my oven's broken so although we are only 20 minutes away from each other we're certainly not fighting against each other for orders now i've got a four-wheel drive so which is a typical queensland vehicle <laughs> so um yeah nothing not have to do that shouldn't be necessary you deliver to stockists at ambient temperature except for the pastry which is frozen so you could just have an esky for that but all the breads and pizza bases and things just go at ambient temperature mine was i have some big plastic crates that i just pack into yeah it should be fine yeah it wasn't actually a consideration on the um the application um they weren't concerned about what vehicle it would be used, just that the food would be transported at the right temperature. I think temperature was a big thing for my health officer to make sure that if you're going to deliver something, if you're not going to be leaving your car, you know, in the sun for an hour before delivering, you know, that kind of common sense stuff. I've gone to uh, local IGAs, especially the, the nicest sort of IGA that has the good deli section and things like that to other supermarkets like we have farmer jacks here which is um a big supermarket they obviously the health food chains go vita stock a lot of um, prime alternative across the country um naturopaths wellness sort of centers chiropractors the other one that might be quite a good one um which i haven't done yet but it's kind of been on my to-do list at some point is um food trucks you know, they do coffee. They always, always have something that's gluten-free. Um, and a lot of the girls are getting into the, um, the boxes, the food boxes, you know, the delivery boxes. So that's another option. So that's who my, oh. my big stockist is, um, an online farmer's market. And basically people go on, I was actually a customer of theirs before, and then I approached them when I started the business. Um, but basically people go online, order their fruit and veggies and their sauerkraut and their pickles and kombucha and then pick off some of the primal alternative products. I bake all day on a Wednesday when they send me the orders on a Wednesday morning, deliver to their um, warehouse on a Wednesday evening. And then from the Thursday, Friday, Saturday, they then deliver those products to people. Um, so yeah, that's another good one to, to get into. Um, the other one that's also quite good um, here in Brisbane is there are quite a few little organic um, butchers, little family owned businesses. Um, and my local butcher um, started stocking a lot of gluten free stuff. Um, and I think because his family went gluten free. Um, so I've approached him. They're interested in the, the wraps. Um, so, yeah, anyone, who's, any organization that's got a bit of a foodie focus sort of normally a brochure and introduction maybe take a couple of samples a sample of a, a cookie just you know for the first time if they're interested in tasting more you could you know do a proper tasting then um yeah just an introduction of myself and and the brand so a brochure or the stockers brochure um along with my business card and yeah and then just follow up don't just leave it and walk away always follow up Somebody who does the, either the manager or, or they have an ordering manager sometimes um, who, who looks after that kind of thing. I think it's not every IGA. We certainly got a few around us and there, there were one or two that probably it wouldn't be a great fit for, but there were others that it is a more of a sort of, I, I don't know, an upmarket IGA or more of a deli sort of IGA, not the, not the country town IGA that I used to have to shop at. I've been pretty lucky. I have my terms are two weeks and that's what I discuss when we talk about ordering. Um, but there are some small, smaller grocery stores who pay cash as I walk in the door with, and deliver the products. But generally it's two weeks and most of my stockers are pretty good. I have to say there's very few that I have to chase up um, beyond that. I know some people have struggled, but it is just about being, you know, consistent with them and saying the terms um, of, of my business and, yeah, staying on top of them, I suppose, and not letting them run away with it and still supplying a month down the track when they haven't paid you um, because that does become difficult. You are a small business generally and you need the cash flow coming in to keep ordering your products and 
um, stay on top of your expenses. So yeah, it's definitely, you do need to stay on top of your accounts. Um, there was a, a chat in the Prime Minister's group yesterday about this. There was a Prime Minister saying, oh, you know, I've got, a, you know, so most stockists are nice and they will pay, but there's always, you know, stockists not paying is a small but inevitable part of running a business, right? Um, and there was a chat about this in the group and, and the Prime Ministers were just helped sort of brainstorming some of the things that they do to help uh, with stockists get paid on time. And one of the great tools we've got is the stockist agreement. So when a stock is coming on board, you've approached them, they want to make an order. You have a stockist agreement that has been put together by a lawyer and stockists can sign it in there. In there, it just lays the terms in terms of, you know, orders, I need your order in by Tuesday. I need you to pay in seven days or 14 days, whatever it is for you. Um, but at the end of the day, you know, if they don't pay, then they're not an ideal stockist. And it's okay to tell them that you're not going to supply them anymore if they can't pay your bills and then you need to go and find another stockist somewhere else. So, um, yeah, Sha, I know you're sort of new, you're sort of in month two. Have you had much trouble getting your invoices paid so far? No, um, I think because I'm a small business and I'm just you know, one man band, um, suppliers are more cognizant of the fact that I do need a steady income in order to order the ingredients. Um, so. And it's not because I've mentioned it, it's because they've said we, we will pay our payment terms of 30 days, but because you're, you're a small operator, we'll pay um, on receipt of invoice. So, What happens if, if you do rent your house? Uh, you need to speak to your landlord before you apply for your food business registration. Some councils say you don't need to, but I think it's just the right thing to do. And the key thing you want to be saying to your landlord is that your business is a small business. There's not gonna be any customers coming to the house, so it's not gonna be a traffic issue. And there's not gonna be any additional wear and tear on the property because you're just baking. You're not turning the house into a factory. So that's a good one for that. I know some prime listers do. Some wanna take it more on a larger scale and they think they can put more out in a commercial kitchen or some of, them, some of the prime listers have just enjoyed packing everything up and going to work and having that work home separation. Um, and it's doable, but you just have to be mindful that the rent of the kitchen is gonna come out of your profit margin because this essentially is designed for an at home model, but it can be done if you're doing it on a larger scale. I certainly did, uh, it went wild. Uh, the business just went through the roof when everybody was stocking up and doing their panic buying around March. Um, and then it certainly went quiet as I think everybody realized they had to eat some of what they've bought. <laughs> and um, yeah, and then, it, and then I certainly did as, as delis and restaurants and things closed, I certainly did lose a few orders and a few stockers, but they have slowly come back on board because they've reworked their business model and they've had to also find ways to get their, their product out. So they've gone online, they've done, you know, takeaways, they've, you know, they've made plans as well. So the business has slowly come back up again. And um, I'm probably close to what it was again, um, pre COVID, even though I haven't got all those stockers back. Some of them have just not been able to, to come back, but you know, that's how it goes. So it's also, you know, an evolving business where you've got to, you can't just think I've got two or three stockers and that's it. You, you know, sort of always keeping an ear out, looking out, talking to people and building up relationships so that you have, you know, maybe somebody in the background who you can approach. Um, so yeah, it has certainly, my business has changed a bit, but it hasn't died completely. It's a bit tricky one for me to answer because I, um, I joined um, on the 11th of May and was, producing by middle of June. So um, I think that says a lot about this business when you can join and start a business in the throes of COVID. And I didn't just start slowly, like I've literally hit the road running and I've got my fast running shoes on, I've just got to keep going. Um, so I think that's a good case in point that uh, people are much more invested now in their health than what they were pre-COVID. So the market will always be there for the product. Mine wasn't as smooth as Shah sounds. <laughs> I did wait about four, four months, four or five months for my kitchen to be approved. 
uh, a very sticky council member who was not going to make my life easy. Um, but at that point, we didn't have the amazing um, food safety plan that we have now. We didn't have all the lab tests in a whole booklet that um, Helen's put together now. So I didn't have anything at the beginning to give to my um, health officer. Um, I do have a dog and that was one of the big concerns was that and my kitchen is open plan. So there's no ways to shut the dog out of the kitchen completely because he was saying he's never allowed um, in the kitchen. But I do, did have a scullery off the side and I had to put a self-closing hinge on that door so that I could bake in there and the dog could never go in there and that was fine. My ovens aren't in there, but I do have a fridge and a double sink and the dishwasher in there. So it was, it was doable, but, um, and it's, he left the council and the new lady who came in didn't have such an issue and she was much more approachable and much friendlier. And by that point we had the whole safety booklet going as well. So we had a whole lot more information to hand over. So it did take a while, but we got there in the end and Helen was hugely supportive through that process. And yeah, we, it's normally doable. There's very few councils I think that have absolutely said no. Is It might take a while, it might take a bit of negotiation. And, and in the end, they're supposed to be helping you to achieve what you need to, to be able to run the business. They're not supposed to be just saying no. Um, they're there to encourage business to to happen in the in the council. So, yeah, definitely doable. I think certainly in the current climate, um, the councils are very invested in developing small business. Um, so much to the point that the original council application fee was completely waived. I did not pay a cent uh, for my application, which you know is incredible. Um, and when I first Put my paperwork in my eho said no nope, no nope, you, you can't do this you're not doing this and so um it was a big process of educating the eho that this wasn't typical bread the product isn't typical it's not the normal stuff that you see in the supermarkets or anywhere else um and then with the support of um the food safety program or the other guidance that you get um, and also the other prime ministers, because everyone's had a story or a challenge or, um, or a difficulty along the way. Um, you know, it was within a week, I think, he came back and he said, okay, cool, um, put in the rest of your paperwork and I'll see. And then he phoned me the next week and he said, okay, I'm coming tomorrow. <laughs> I'm coming to do your inspection tomorrow. And I just went, oh my word, okay. Um, so you might encounter some resistance, you might not. Um, it might be a smooth process, it might be a quick one, it might be a long one. It's just, um, we've got the backing of a hundred people across Australia who do this um, and have gone through the process. So um, leveraging that definitely helped me. And just on that one, um, we did have a couple of councils that said no. So there was Harvey Bay and Cairns and they were like the two like that said no. But since then we've got approval from Harvey Bay and from Cairns. So I think that the, the, the no's were back in like when Tanya was saying like 2017, 2018, when we didn't know what we know and we hadn't had that much experience with food business registrations. But I like to think of myself as a bit of a pro now for <laughs> being able to uh, overcome the objections that are the same all the time, like the ones that Shah was saying, you know, they just really don't know what we're doing. It's an education thing. Um, yeah, and even if you get a no, Originally, and that's why I always suggest uh, you decide to become a prime minister before you start your food business, uh, because you've got more chance of getting your food business registration with our help yeah. than you would do if you're on your own. Um, I'm getting more from a stockist generally. Um, yeah, I've built my business around my stockists and have slowly done the private orders as a as an extra. So my main focus has been my stockists because I know that's kind of a guaranteed every week, whereas um, retail can come and go a bit more. Um, I do have a few very set, very supportive retail customers, but it's mainly my stockists, yeah. Yeah, same here. Um, I wouldn't say a large percentage would be retail, but they do keep coming back, um, which is obviously encouraging. And it also depends on the mix of how you want to run your business. If you do a lot of markets, then you would have more retail customers that might contact you in between market days uh, when they're looking for products. So 
Um, I'm not doing markets yet. Um, I thought I'd bite this one off first and, and chew on it a bit before I added another element into the mix. I don't think I've failed if I've learned a lot along the way and I've, I've still enjoyed what I've done. I uh, um, run a business for myself. I've learned a whole lot of new skills. I'm not tech savvy at all. I've not amazing on Instagram, but I've certainly learned how to use it a bit. Um, I've seen done video clips that I've never done. I'm on this. So I, I've certainly learned skills along the way. Um, and I hope I could take them on to do other things. So I don't, I wouldn't see it as a waste of time. I've, I've gained a lot. I've grown through the process. Um, and I've been involved in my community, which is what I wanted to do. So even if I had to give up the business, I don't, I don't feel like I have wasted two years at all. Yeah, same. And when I first looked at um, becoming a prime minister, I, I think I calculated that there was a certain amount of time. Let's call it, I don't know, let's call it six months that I had to do this. Um, at not, not a lot of revenue every month to pay back the investment. Um, so, you know, if you, and then, then you'd be square, right? And then you'd also have all the added skills and, and knowledge and learnings that Tanya just mentioned. Um, so it's, the investment isn't a hundred thousand dollars. It's not where you go, oh, if I fail, this is going to be a hundred thousand dollars that I could have put somewhere else. Um, so yeah, I mean, if you get to a point of breaking even on the investment that you put into it, then, and you've learned something along the way and you could potentially use that in the future to, you know, in a different business, then there's no harm done. Um, sales is certainly not in my um, skill set, uh, and I was one of my biggest things as well. It's not not something I enjoy doing, but I I love the product. And I suppose once you've tasted it, and if you have you enjoying using it and eating it, and my family's enjoying it, I don't have any hesitation in saying to someone, "It's great. You should try it." Um, and I think it's not. Um, don't feel like I'm pushing something on them at all. It's their decision, but I believe in it and I think that comes across when you approach someone is that you enjoy the products, you see the benefit in the way you're eating. My background is pharmacy. So for me, health, it, it was always important, but I didn't want to do it um, with drugs anymore. So I think food is the best medicine there is. And this was a, a really good way for me to segue from pharm pharmacy to, um, to a food is medicine sort of and I believe in it and I think that comes across I've never felt like I've been pushing people to come on board as stockers and it very much is a relationship um, and if if they're not interested well I'm I'm certainly not going to push it on them because I want a two-way relationship that benefits both of us um, yeah and people love food so you know give them one of our chocolate chip cookies and who's going to say no to that um, but you know it, um, it certainly, I, I don't feel like I'm doing a hard sell when I have a conversation about primal alternatives because it's, it's like Tanya said, when it's something that you really believe in and love this much, um, it's not a sales process, it's, it's a conversation. Uh, and I, I used to, I, I was in the conferencing industry for a really long time and part of my job was to do sponsorship sales at one point and I absolutely hated it because I couldn't give them a tangible benefit. I was selling an idea. Whereas with this, you know, you give them some samples and they can try it and they can interact with it and they can use it in different forms and ways. And I agree, I've been in um, sales all my life, working in gyms, selling gym memberships and then um, as a recruiter. So selling um, the recruiting service. So it's always been a concept and never a product. And I used to always think, damn, I wish I could just sell a box because you know, the box doesn't have an opinion. You know, you'd, you'd sell a person to a company and then the company didn't want the person or vice versa. So it was the selling a concept much harder than selling a product uh, where, where people can smell it, touch it, taste it, feel it. And because we don't have any minimum order quantities, we're not one of those, you know, mocks and skews kind of food <laughs> business. You can just, you know, you could start with an order as small as one packet of cookies. So it really is, um, it's not a big gamble for a stockist to give us a go and you know we we can be there and do tasters for customers and really help 
uh, get those, you know, products. So it's a two way, it's a two thing, two step process. You know, you've got to get the product in the stockists and then you've got to get the stock off the shelves into the customer's basket. But like um, Tanya was saying, a lot of our uh, relation uh, stock is based on relationships and there's a lot of cross promoting and and char said as well you know her stock is promote her and, and it's just it's fun like it's just it's like a collaborative way to to get product out as opposed to a pitch in a sale i just see it as baking products and making offers well that would be i don't have the figures on that to be honest because we don't do any sales reporting and we don't monitor that. So what I can show you is uh, how long it would take to bake items and what the profit margin is on those items. Because um, I don't want to say, oh, you could earn, I don't know, 10 grand a month. In, you could do 10 grand a month sales if you're not as fast or as organized or getting your equipment, uh, sorry, your ingredients from the same stockist um and if you're selling everything at wholesale price compared to that person who's doing the 10 grand does that make sense so there's if you go to there's a there's a page on the website called how much can i earn as a primer lista and that covers all of that there um because i don't like saying you could make this or you could make that really it's just a case of working out how many days you want to bake whether you think that amount of money is um that you can make in that day is worth your while because we've all got different versions of um success and and how much that what that looks like um and i guess the other thing to mention on there is you are just a one person business this model isn't scalable you know you can't employ 10 people to make the products because they'd all need to be licensed as well so it's just what you can physically bake as a one person band no i'd say that's accurate as it really does depend on what you can do in a day as well um, and what you're prepared to do in a day, what you have to give up or sacrifice in order to, to get um, to those levels, I suppose. Uh, I, I protect what I want um, initially in my home life and family life uh, and friends and the volunteering that I do and fit my baking in so that I know that I have, you know, um, two days free to do that. Um, and that's as much as I'm prepared to, to do at the moment so uh, if I wanted to scale it up I'm sure I could but I've found a healthy balance for me and yeah not that I've encountered I've learned and grown as I've done it and landed up doing some catering um yeah for <laughs> for different events that have happened so I, I'm interested in food and I suppose I'm so I'm willing to give it a go and and learn from those events uh, I I I don't have any food background as such, no. Neither. And to be honest, my mother-in-law always jokes that she, she still can't believe I'm doing this because when she was visiting from the UK last year, she asked me to make her a birthday cake and I bought one because I just always thought that I was a terrible baker. And, you know, I'm a, I'm a good cook by my husband's um, recommendation, but baking's never really been something I've been really good at. Um, and this model fits because it's, you know, anyway, it's, um, yeah, you don't need any formal qualifications. Uh, I think there are some of the girls certainly who are working through their own health journeys while they're baking, but it, and that's, that becomes having your boundaries as well and knowing what you can do, um, and what you physically can do. I'm struggling with a bit of tennis elbow at the moment, but you know, it's just about managing, managing what you what your work level is. And I think that's in any walk of life. Um, I don't think that's really particular to primal alternative. Yeah, I think one of the things that definitely brought me on the pathway to discovering primal alternative was um, I, I've struggled for the last four or five years with terrible energy levels and foggy head and really sore body. I just turned 40 this year. And since, you know, 35, I'm just always in a lot of pain. And um, anyway, all these symptoms that have been going on for ages. And finally, about 18 months ago, I started um, to look at it a bit more closely and then um, struggle with adrenal the fatigue. And, you know, um, eventually, then about 12 months ago, um, I found that I had Epstein-Barr virus, um, which uh, can also, it flares up every now and then. Um, 
it's basically the virus that gives you glandular fever for those that don't know. But it's, the virus never leaves your body. So it lies dormant and then a stressful situation happens or you pick up a cold or you know, a, the flu or something and it just knocks you for a six. Um, and not a word of a lie, 12 months ago or 18 months ago, two years ago, I'd be dropping my kids off to kindy and hitting the sofa, exhausted, not able to get up. Um, and changes in diet and lifestyle. Not that I've had major issues in terms of my diet, but um, you know, those things have certainly helped me. Um, my husband then also at the end of last year was diagnosed with ulcerative colitis, uh, which is a chronic condition. And um, he also has had to go grain free. Um, so yeah, I think that your health journey certainly plays into this. And I think that once you start um, using the products that you bake, um, yeah, that, that, that's kind of why it becomes part of having a conversation rather than selling or pushing the product because you're an advocate for it. You, you know what the benefits are um, in using these foods over more commercial things. Yeah, and I can concur from interviewing hundreds of potential primal listers now. The question I always start with is tell me about your health journey because you have to have been on some kind of health journey to get to eat this weird food, right? <laughs> you don't just stumble across it. You know, we, we've all had to make some kind of changes, whether it's for ourselves, often it's for our children. You know, we, we're just happy to continue eating crap ourselves. But then if something happens to our kids, oh, everything's got to change, you know? So, um, yeah, so that's everybody. And, and that's what why this uh, is such a beautiful collaboration because all the prime listers understand the health journey of all their customers. And that's why it becomes more of a relationship. And um, I was just talking to another prime lister the other day, uh, Tara in South Australia. She's saying at her market, so many people come up to her and share their health stories and say, thank you for making this food for me. You know, it's really changing my life, which is just feels pretty good to go home and put your feet up after a market where you've connected you know it's not just a sale it's it's relationships which is awesome um, i used wave i think it is wave <laughs> i just know what the app looks like on my phone <laughs> i think it's wave so that was a free one um i i didn't have a business you know with an accounting system already so i just started with a free one and that's that's been great for me, it does all the invoices. I keep track of it um, pretty easily. Um, and I, yeah, my, between my husband and I, we do the monthly finances and then at the end of the year, hand it over to the, our tax um, guy to take care of the final submission. So it's as easy as that for me. Yeah, mine is, um, I do through zero, and I think it's a $10 a year fee. And it basically um, develops all your profit and loss statements and everything through your bank account. So um, any transactions will get allocated to credit and debit and it spits out a report at the end, uh, which I find straightforward. And then yeah, just invoices, I do my own invoices that are, that are sent to customers. No, oh, oh. <laughs> it's very tempting. It is seriously really tempting to try and cater for everybody. And especially once you have a relationship and they say, oh, suddenly, but I can't eat chia seeds. And you know that they're chia seeds in the fruit toast and the turmeric and ham. Well, I'm sorry, that's not the product for them then. They, there's lots of other options. Um, first of all, it wouldn't comply with any of our labels. Um, uh, so that doesn't work. That's a that, you know, a re legal requirement to have your ingredients on your labels and, and then to try and keep track of it during a bake and to know that you've maybe left the chia seeds out of one loaf of bread for one particular customer, it just doesn't work. It, it, you, you can't do it. it yeah. Nope. <laughs> yeah, and you can't really please everybody all the time. Um, and as Tanya said, there's, there's a wide enough selection in the products we have to cater for egg-free, um, in certain things like the, you know, the wraps or um, nut-free bread over bread that contains almond meal. Um, so that, that there is a bit for everybody, but we can't please everybody. Well said. Don't change the recipes. It actually says on there, 
in the uh, other resources. Sorry to crush your creative flair, but no, you can't change the recipes. And we all get asked, but honestly, once you start doing it for one person, then you just end up doing it for other people. And like Tanya said, the, la the labels become inaccurate and therefore illegal. It's just not worth it. It's just not worth it. So um, we've got so many different products now that cater for so many different needs, whether it's dairy-free, egg-free, low-carb, vegan, paleo, you know, there's vegetarian, there's, there's something there for everybody. So it's just a case of saying, oh, I'm sorry, you can't eat chia seeds. Why don't you try this? We've got a lot of things in there for mm. everybody. But we definitely don't try and please all the people all the time. That's one of our mottos, right? I've only got a 60 centimeter oven and I was trying to get, I can get, if I put the tins in eat properly, 12 loaves in there. Um, but I found they don't bake as evenly. My heat distribution isn't good enough. So I actually reduced the number of loaves and it's quicker just to do another batch than to try and squeeze more into my oven. I do have a convection microwave, which I find bakes even better than my oven. So I've been using that as well. So I've got a 60 centimeter oven and a convection microwave and I've, that's all I've ever had. Um, I've got a 90 centimeter oven. Um, and I think with the 90 centimeter, it seems to be a little bit, uh, because it's so wide, it's not as high as a, I, I don't know. I can't remember what the size is of a normal oven. Um, so I was thinking that I would probably get two rows of breads in, but you've got to allow enough room for the breads to rise. Um, because some of them, especially the pumpkin uh, and zucchini, have a beautiful top. Um, so I fit in 11 loaves at a time, and I don't have any problem with um, heat circulation. So it's been pretty consistent. Well, um, I started with a 600 oven, and then I thought, oh, I'm going to upgrade to a 900, and you just get you can get exactly the same amount in. Um, so because like what Cha was saying with the, the height, that it's not as wide, it's, it's wider, but not higher. Um, and what I found, I liked my 600 better. And I just went to the tip shop and got another couple of 600 oven trays so that when I was doing cookies and pizzas, I could get four racks of cookies and pizzas in because obviously they're really flat. So um, if you're thinking, oh, I need to upgrade my oven or re renovate my kitchen, you don't. Just work with what you got because both a 600 and a 900 are just as good. Yeah, all those little things that I was really concerned about at the start just have not even featured or eventuated. And, you know, like they say, 86% of all concerns and worries sort themselves out. And this has certainly happened. I don't think I've had any major challenges um, that haven't been able to be fixed with some support and that's the other thing I've just got to say the Prima Lista network and the sisterhood is phenomenal like Helen was saying earlier um, we, we, people were brainstorming yesterday over a problem um, so everyone's really collaborative supporting encouraging <laughs> <laughs>